This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated streaming service that showcases fantastic films from all over the world. Start your one month free trial right now by going to MUBI.com slash Entertain the Elk. When I say the word heaven, what images come to mind? Most people would probably say some combination of clouds, bright lights, blue skies, pearly gates, streets paved with gold, family and friends, angels and God. And it makes sense that those images would come to mind, because whenever heaven is depicted in film, it's usually with that well-established iconography that has come to represent the location. But why is that? Where did these elements first come from? Well, we have to go all the way back to the very idea of heaven itself. The concept of an afterlife has existed in different iterations across a number of religions, mythologies, and cultures since the beginning of time. It's sometimes referred to as paradise or nirvana, but in this video, I want to focus on heaven from a Christian perspective, and that means looking at the Christian Bible. Now, the Bible is a collection of 66 books, all telling one unified story. And each of these books is written in a unique combination of different literary styles. There's narrative, such as biographies, history, and parables. Discourse, such as essays, letters, and speeches. And poetry, such as songs and prophecies. Even though poetry is prevalent throughout the Bible, composing about a third of the entire text, they're probably the most difficult sections to understand. The writers use extremely dense, creative and figurative language like allegory, hyperbole, euphemism and metaphor in order to help evoke emotion and imagination in the mind of the reader. For instance, in the book of Luke, on the eve of his own crucifixion and moments away from his betrayal by Judas, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives to pray. His soul is in agony, torn between the immense weight of humanity on his shoulders and the unthinkable suffering he's about to endure on the cross. In Luke 22, verse 44, it's written, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And it could have stopped right there. That statement is accurate, but it doesn't properly convey the inner anguish of his soul. And so poetic language is used to better communicate the emotional weight and spark the reader's imagination. So it goes on. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke uses a simile in order to give an external representation to Jesus' internal anguish. It also takes the act of prayer and makes it feel more dynamic and strenuous as it causes him to sweat. It's an interesting comparison, sweat to blood, but one that also makes sense in context as Luke, the writer, was a physician and would have absolutely known the uniqueness and horror of a person's blood dripping heavily to the ground. Poetry helps make the intangible feel, well, more tangible. It attempts to explain the unexplainable. When Shakespeare wrote about love, he didn't describe the science and chemical properties in a formal essay. He wrote beautiful sonnets flowing with creative and figurative language. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and too often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. It reminds me of the space travel scene near the end of the movie Contact, where Jodie Foster's character travels through wormholes, but struggles to adequately describe the celestial beauty and majesty around her. She says, No words <laughs> to describe. I should have said a poem. Our brains are prone to forming pathways. We see the world in one way, and there's never any veering from that path. That's why poetic language is also necessary to help the reader think in different ways. It forces the reader off the path of logic and reasoning, breaking through mental barriers and preconceived notions about the way the world works, and sets them on a new path. The final book of the Bible, Revelation, is primarily written in the prophetical or apocalyptic genre, apocalypse being Greek for the word revelation. Apocalyptic literature recounts a prophet's symbolic dreams and visions concerning current or future events from a heavenly perspective. And it's here that we're given numerous descriptions of heaven, but again, the author, John, is tasked with describing the indescribable, and so they use poetic language and symbolism to best communicate emotions and visions to the reader. The new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Now, there's a lot going on here, but the main idea is that the separation between heaven and earth, God and his church, will no longer exist. They will become one, where God dwells amongst his people, the new Jerusalem, in its new and perfect state. John uses a simile to compare the covenantal love of God in his newly pure and perfect church to a bride and groom on their wedding day. John uses the most striking, beautiful image he could think of, a woman dressed in white coming down the aisle and the celebration of two separates coming together in covenantal love to become one. The New Jerusalem Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal, it had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the Lamb. There are certain numbers in the Bible that carry significance. In this instance, seven represents God's spiritual perfection because it's a symbol of God's work completed. In Genesis, God creates the heavens and the earth in six days and rests on the seventh day. Seven also denotes the completion of the crucifixion. When Jesus spoke seven statements from the cross at the completion of his earthly duties, 12 also carries special significance, representing God's perfect power and authority. There are 12 tribes of Israel, 12 disciples of Jesus, 12 cakes in the tabernacle, 12 spies scouted the promised land, 12 appointed governors. And here in Revelation, 12 is used a number of times to describe the new Jerusalem, which helps reinforce its perfection. The New Garden of Eden Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And the night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This last section of Revelation beautifully bookends with Genesis, as John uses parallel imagery of the Garden of Eden and God's perfection through nature. His provision is described as pure, clean water that gives life. And then there's the tree of life again, which serves as another reminder of God's restorative nature. The tree bears 12 kinds of fruit, again representing God's perfect power and authority, and now, here at the end of the Bible, we are invited to return and enjoy God's blessings, which we were separated from because of the fall in the garden. And this is nothing that we earned ourselves, but a gift freely given by Jesus' perfect life and death, the flawless lamb sacrifice, atoning for sins, which is why he is referred to time and time again as the lamb. These passages at the end of Revelation align with God's word, constantly referencing and alluding to other passages from scripture, and they paint a picture of heaven that is joyous, peaceful, healing, and full of light, beautiful nature, and God's presence. These are the elements artists have utilized for generations when depicting heaven. Some of the most notable examples are the church fresco paintings from Italy's High Renaissance period. Fresco is a unique technique where the artist paints directly on freshly laid wet plaster so that the painting becomes a part of the wall or ceiling. This aligned with the Baroque architecture of the era, which was highly decorative. The Catholic Church wanted to utilize this style so that their churches would be viewed as one elaborate work of art that would amaze and inspire anyone who walked in. 
It's this combination of artistic technique and architecture that inspired Michelangelo's The Last Judgment at the Sistine Chapel, and Antonio de Correggio's Assumption of the Virgin at the Cathedral of Parma, and the vision of St. John the Evangelist at Patmos at San Giovanni Evangelista. Now, The Last Judgment depicts the second coming of Christ and the final judgment by God of all humanity, but there are still elements from Revelation and the rest of Scripture found in Michelangelo's painting. At first glance, the painting is daunting, large in scale, containing hundreds of figures. But despite its density, the overall composition is broken down into tiers and quadrants. A beardless, oddly muscular Christ is centered with a glowing halo of light emanating from behind him. The bottom left are the elect, rising up to heaven by angels, while the bottom right are the damned, pulled down to hell by demons. In the middle section, the inhabitants of heaven stand amongst the clouds and are joined by the newly saved. It's a scene of celebration and reunification as people kiss and embrace one another. The top right and left are composed of angels displaying the instruments of Christ's passion. The pillar on which Christ was flogged, the crown of thorns on his head, and the cross on which he died. The entire piece is washed in a mixture of skin tones and a sky blue. And in contrast to the chaos down on earth below, heaven is depicted as orderly and peaceful. Both of Correggio's works in Parma are illusionistic ceiling frescoes painted on interior domes. They utilize perspective techniques and spatial effects like foreshortening in order to create the illusion of a three-dimensional space above the viewer. In both cases, the illusion was an open sky extending to heaven. The perspective of this illusion is centered towards one focal point. In this case, Christ and the Virgin Mary, respectively. The steep foreshortening of the figures, the painted walls and pillars, creates the illusion of heaven opening up. In both paintings, the brightest point is in the center of the painting, representing the bright, almost blinding light of heaven. Swirling around the focal point of light are angels and inhabitants of heaven amongst the clouds. Clouds are often used to represent heaven in paintings, and it helps convey the new heaven and new earth coming together as one just as a bride and groom become one on their wedding day, the new perfection of nature found in the new Garden of Eden. When heaven and similar equivalents are portrayed in film, they take on a variety of different forms. It's a baseball field in Field of Dreams, a courtroom in A Matter of Life and Death, a way station in Heaven Can Wait, and a giant party in Down to Earth, a very Harold and Kumar Christmas, and This is the End. But it primarily takes on some form of nature, the simplest and usual go-to element to signify heaven is with clouds. The two have practically become synonymous. It's a quick and easy cue to the audience, with the almost blinding white light and often white clothes of the setting. But there are other elements of nature that have been used as well. In the Tree of Life, heaven is a beach where loved ones are reunited. In Always, Gladiator, A Dog's Journey, and even Babe, Pig in the City, heaven is an expansive field of grass and blooming flowers, or a field of wheat swaying in the breeze. And then there's the nature on display in The Lovely Bones and What Dreams May Come. Even though The Lovely Bones is an in-between, limbo-like setting on the edge of heaven, they both have this beautifully bizarre amalgamation of elements that feels like a fever dream. The vibrant colors and wild imagination creates a place that truly feels beyond our understanding. Here's what director Vincent Ward said regarding the design of heaven in his film What Dreams May Come. What struck me most about this project was the challenge of envisaging an afterlife so that it was not just cotton wool clouds or a white space filled with smoke. I also wanted it to be relevant and have a contemporary conceptual spin in an age where many people no longer believe in an afterlife. To make it work, I needed to find a way to see it. The key here was choosing to make the afterlife a subjective world. Each paradise could be different, so each paradise and hell could actually vary from person to person. When Chris dies, he finds himself in an afterlife that emulates his wife Annie's work. She restored 19th century paintings, and in her spare time painted pictures which reflect elements of their life together. Now, Chris finds himself walking within her living paintings. In the specific, deciding to make Annie a painter and fine art restorer answered the question of how I would show the afterlife. By borrowing from paintings in former periods, I could invoke a time when people more commonly believed in such things as well as make use of the visual language these artists employed. We looked back through many eras of paintings that depicted the afterlife, wondering how could they be relevant now? What shape was there that was true for us? 
paintings of heaven like church frescoes influence the modern depiction of heaven in film. But the most striking difference between heaven in those church frescoes and heaven in a majority of modern films is the absence of God. The Bible and the corresponding frescoes portraying moments found in scripture all surround one larger story of God's redemption of his people through his son Jesus. God is always the central hero in the story of the Bible. In Revelation 21, 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Heaven is where God dwells amongst his people. It's where the two are reconciled together. But a majority of these films depicting heaven focus instead on the self. Just as Vincent Ward alluded to when he was designing his version of heaven in What Dreams May Come, the setting is taken and manipulated around the purposes of that particular film, its story, and its main character. And so heaven becomes this place that's not about God at all, it's about the individual. In A Little Bit of Heaven, God appears to Kate Hudson's character in heaven, but here, God is more like a genie who grants her character three wishes before she dies. In Field of Dreams and The Lovely Bones, the afterlife serves to help the character complete their unfinished business on Earth. And in What Dreams May Come, heaven almost serves as an obstacle, keeping Robin Williams' character from his wife down in hell. With the focus on the self, heaven is often portrayed as this wish-fulfillment fantasy where your greatest desires come true. As I mentioned earlier, this could be a party where the occupants are able to gorge their appetites. That's heaven. Anything you can think of is yours. But it could also provide the one thing that the character wants most. In Ice Age, The Meltdown, that might be an acorn. Or if you're Kenny, in South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, that might be, well... Okay, so what does heaven look like? Well, no one knows. And yes, I can practically hear some of you out there groaning at that answer, chalking it up as a simple cop-out. But since this entire video is built upon a biblical description of heaven found in scripture, I'll throw in one last verse written by the Apostle Paul as he refused to speculate on what heaven looked like. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. No one knows what heaven looks like on this side of death. It's an exercise in futility attempting to describe something so grand and majestic. It reminds me of an excerpt from Dante's Paradiso, when Dante travels into heaven and beholds God directly. He witnesses all of creation held together by God's providence with the ultimate purpose of reuniting all things to himself. But even he confesses that he can't put to words everything that he sees and feels. From that moment, my vision was greater than our speech, which fails at such a sight, and memory too fails at such excess. Like him that sees in a dream, and after the dream the passion wrought by it remains, and the rest returns not to his mind, such am I. For my vision almost wholly fades, and still there drops within my heart the sweetness that was born of it. If you're stuck at home, desperate for something unique and thought-provoking to watch, then for you, heaven might just look like Mubi. Mubi is a curated streaming service showcasing hand-selected films from around the globe. Every day, they premiere a new film. Whether it's a timeless classic, a cult favorite, an acclaimed masterpiece, there's always something new to discover. My favorite part is their new First Films First series that highlights the early work of popular directors. For instance, Denis Villeneuve is one of my favorite directors working right now with films like Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049, but it's only because of Mubi that I was able to watch one of his earliest films, August 32nd on Earth. And there's so many more films to choose from. So stop what you're doing and go to Mubi.com slash Entertain the Elk so you can start your one month free trial and start enjoying movies right now. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video that was a little different, a little off the beaten path of what I usually do, but I think that's what I really want this channel to be. I want it to be a place where you can come to, watch something different, and no matter what the topic may be, you can always know that it's going to be unique, interesting, and always entertaining. As always, make sure you're subscribed below, but also make sure you click the bell below so that way you can join the Entertain the Elk team and make sure that you never miss a new video whenever it comes out. 
I'd like to thank the patrons who help support this channel. If you'd like to support this channel, please go to the description below and you can click over to my Patreon page where you can see all the exclusive rewards that patrons get. But another great way that you can help support this channel is by checking out the sponsors that I'm partnering with. Go check them out for free by using my unique code and give them a chance to earn your business. It helps me maintain strong relationships with sponsors, which helps me make more videos. That's all I have for you guys right now, but thank you again so much for watching. I'm ex really excited for a new year in 2021, so I hope you come along on the ride, and I will see you all next time.